Hello, everyone. I'm Janis, the session chair for this room. Welcome to day two of PackagingCon. Um, I'm here to uh, introduce you introduce you to Efraim Flaschner, who's going to talk about adventures in packaging Rust programs. So, Efraim, take it away. Okay, thanks. I want to, I guess, start by saying it's strange looking at my laptop screen and not seeing people here. I'm just going to assume that there's people out there and you're watching me. And I'm sure it's much less interesting for you watching me talk about you being there. But anyway, so packaging Rust crates and geeks. Uh, you'd think packaging crates would be, oops, would be fairly simple, but you know, it turned out being a little harder than expected. So about me quickly, I've been a Geeks contributor since 2015. Uh, my first Rust-related commit, it seems, was in December 2017. Um, I don't actually use Rust or Cargo or really anything like that. Uh, I'm really mostly interested in the distro maintenance and bumping the packages and making everything work and just you know keeping everything running. And got involved with, uh, with Rust really because uh, it showed up as part of my day job. Uh, was, uh, some of the guys had written a program in Rust and they said, hey, we, you know, we have this nice Rust binary, we'd like to go and run it and we need you to package it. And so you know, that's basically how that ended up starting. Uh, so I guess, quick overlap between uh, Rust and Geeks. So I looked this up. The first stable Rust release was in May 2015. Uh, December 2016, Geeks finally started, finally started, uh, we started getting uh, Rust packaging bits and we had a crate importer. Uh, didn't actually really do anything with it for a while. Uh, we used some uh, blessed bootstrap binaries from upstream and just used those similar to like we use with Haskell and some other languages. And we finally got a cargo build system to build things. Uh, it just kind of sat there for a couple of years. We got cargo. We used MRESC-C to bootstrap instead of using uh, the upstream release binaries. And you know, like a lot of these things, you know, we first started actually having to make things work when we needed it for something else. So uh, Geeks being a GNU distribution, we used IceCat instead of Firefox. So uh, with uh, release uh, with 60, that long-term release, uh, suddenly started needing Rust, so suddenly that started working. And then you see the next two, then yeah, so then a year later, uh, instead of just saying, instead of Firefox just saying, hey, we need Rust, it was, hey, we need Rust, and we need this other uh, program called CBindGen. So we spent a couple of months and you know, added added some crates, figured out how to actually go and build the different uh, packages together. And you know, in time, you know, we managed to put it together in time. Uh, that one, um, see that one I think I actually threw together in the end. Uh, ended up just taking the 50 or 60 uh, various Rust crates that were downloaded, if you just said, um, I don't actually remember the command offhand. It was something like uh, cargo, cargo build C bind gen. I, I see how little I actually uh, end up using it myself. Uh, whatever the command was to go and say, you know, go ahead and download the crates that I need and then build C bind gen. We just said, okay, so we have these 60 or so uh, crates that we need, throw them all in as source packages once they're all in together in the build container, build C bind gen, and now we have it. So that's what we did at first. Uh, over the next couple of months, uh, we went and added another several hundred Rust packages. And so that allowed us to actually go and build the different packages the way you'd actually go and build them if you were uh, developing each one individually using standard packaging things of and okay, well, this package needs these inputs for building and these other ones for testing and these for documentation. And we'd say, great, throw them all in, build it, and keep on going. And so we ended up with some you know, thousand or so packages, uh, all Rust prefixed 
without really a lot of use for them, but yeah, ended up with, uh, I think what were some of the big ones we had? Uh, of course, now like all I can think of right now is sync thing for Go, because that's what made us actually figure out the Go packaging. So other than C Vinegen, um, C Sequoia PGP was one of the big ones that we started putting together early. Uh, the Kitty terminal emulator. Uh, there were a couple of these that we started uh, just packaging large number of crates for. Uh, and so then uh, after another little bit, uh, lib RSVG suddenly, not suddenly, uh, started rewriting parts of the internals in Rust and using crates. So we had to go and that was a mixed build system. So uh, we have uh, code in Geeks to go and say, okay, well, you know, yes, instead of just configure, make, make, install, also go ahead and you know, run uh, Python setup.py build and build the build the Python bits, or in this case, you know, go ahead and build the Rust bits as part of uh, doing everything else that goes on. And that was really more of uh, re rehashing all of the, we had to rehash all of the crates. Uh, this is part of the, you know, Geeks uses a uh, prefix. So everything is in, in slash GNU slash store slash long prefix, and finally name and version number, so everything had to be rehashed. So various bits and pieces that had to be uh, brought in together. And then the most recent thing that changed was uh, we actually now install the crates and the source for later use. So after we go and build, uh, build the different crates, we go and install them. Uh, so instead of just saying, okay, here's a binary, here's a library, or uh, you know, Rust using the sources themselves to go and build everything. Uh, we went and installed the actual crates themselves after we had uh, gone and modified them slightly, uh, installed them into the, the various GNU store hash prefix so that way we could use them again later. So Yes, your example makes more sense. So here's uh, here's SQLite. So after it's built, it's in its big long prefix, and then we have the binary, the headers, the libraries, and separate static output, and that's that's its own bit there. And okay, so this was the pre-February 2021. So after going and building everything, it turns out Rust doesn't do shared libraries unless it's specifically enabled. So we're really just installing license files, which not useful. And that was really the purpose of making the change. Oh dear, that was supposed to change. Okay. So looking quickly at the create package definition. So here we have a bunch of cargo inputs and some cargo development inputs. And I'm going to switch forward and backward a couple of times to uh, compare this with uh, with another package with Newsboat. So here we have inputs and native inputs. The inputs are what the Newsboat binary actually links against. And the native inputs are only needed at build time. So we have get text for translating package config for finding all of the different inputs ASCII doc, like it says for building the documentation and switching back again for a second. Over here, we just have the cargo inputs and development inputs roughly corresponding to inputs and native inputs. And so these ones instead are just sources. So over here, what this is supposed to show is not actually this, it's supposed to show that uh, GNU store and then under share in addition to just doc, there's also, let me go back another one. It also has uh, slash cargo slash registry, and there it has uh, Rust ran 06.crate, and then it has the unpacked source. So less so for uh, RAND, but for other packages, uh, 
there are things where it's um, a lot of there's a number of Rust packages that uh, link to JE malloc or that uh, it's the package config crate that wraps package config. So we take this opportunity to go and actually hard code the path to package configs. So that way, when we use it later as an input, we don't have to say, okay, well, we built uh, Rust package config and we included package config and then these hundred other crates that use package config, we have to make sure to include it. Now we can just say, like you normally would, uh, one of these, it's not, okay, here's, here's our six inputs. You don't have to know about, uh, I can think of one quickly here about Perl or Python that are used to build uh, some of the inputs. They're not needed specifically for building Newsboat. And you don't need to keep not rebuilding end curses every time you're building the package. Sorry, I'm looking at my uh, other computer for a second here. I ended up with a uh, I was sure that everything had synced over, and it turns out not everything did between the two computers. So cargo inputs versus inputs, what's the difference? I uh, mentioned before that cargo inputs, they're only the sources. Uh, there's nothing compiled when we use an actual car when it's listed as a cargo input. And when you use it as an input, you get all the compiled, all the compiled bits, you get the headers, you get any binaries that are there you get something that's ready to actually use for building the next thing. Very useful slide here. Okay, so looking at what I was, uh, I have a actually terrible idea here. I'm going to, can we switch the screen share so that it's showing me instead of my computer screen? Sounds like a terrible idea. I'm going to turn and face the computer at the computer. I might as well just go and get a mirror here. This looks even, this definitely falls into a don't do this at home and make sure everything is actually set up ahead of time. So here is supposed to be our output of Geek's environment. So now I have a finger. So when you're actually using you're actually developing um, with packages in Geeks. You have the option of using uh, Geeks environment as a command, which, uh, which goes and creates an environment with uh, all of the packages that you would be using. So uh, looking quickly at, let's see, we had uh, ASCII doc was one that I remember specifically that we had. Um, yeah, my fingers here. So we used that for um, the documentation. And so, you know, we have, you know, just the bits that are in there plus, yeah. I'm sorry, let me pull it back to myself. So, so FOSDEM 2020 was the last in-person event that I, I went to. Uh, and while I was there, I uh, talked with a number of other uh, package maintainers, uh, and that most of them were, who were working with Rust also. And so, in comparing some of the some of our notes, what we were going with, uh, these were my recollections more recently, is that Geeks uses the sources as extra inputs. So, if we update, say, the crate uh, libc, in theory, that should cause just about everything to be rebuilt. And so, Geeks currently doesn't have tooling to see what that actually does. We, you know, 
because everything is goes in as a source package instead of a package package, uh, we end up with 2,000 leaf packages, and we don't actually know gets, what gets rebuilt easily. Debian has, uh, I've written down, mushed together all the create inputs. This one, you know, the more I think about it, the more like it, it's, it works well. You just take everything, everything goes in together. Uh, the problems that we have of our 2,000 useless source only packages that install only the license files, they don't have that problem. Uh, you know, package needs a newer version of a library, it goes in. Uh, everything gets recompiled for each individual package. It's not really a problem because you've already compiled bits and pieces when you're compiling everything else. And the, you, know, you have the, I guess, shared maintenance burden of you know, now you have these hundreds or thousands of crates all sitting together as one source blob, kind of. But you're creating your, you're creating all of the uh, binaries from them and everything just kind of works. OpenSUSE, I have to admit, I, I don't actually remember what they, how they were working with it. Um, I do want to know. I remember it uh, being quite interesting. So that was the inputs. The outputs is, you know, Geeks, we have our 2,000 useless source-only packages. They don't do anything for us. We build them and throw them away. It's a giant waste of electricity. We can't track from one crate to the next what, what all gets done. Uh, Debian, like I mentioned, they throw everything in, they build all of the crates, and everything is built. And you know, the way that Geeks currently has it working, I, you know, it sounds like a better idea. I'm you know, still concerned about, you know, I'm sure they are too, about uh, saying, oh, well, while I have these other crates, I'll go and add other features that weren't intended for. And I, don't, I haven't looked closely into how Cargo deals with that. And so then they also provide many individual uh, dev crates, dev source crates, uh, similar to all the other dash dev packages that you can go and develop against them. And OpenSUSE takes that a little st a step further and they say, okay, well, you, know, you would need this collection of sources for, for whatever it is you're doing with Rust for, I suppose, for uh, you know, using a, a GUI fame framework, or if you're using you know, GTK-based crates, then you would also need these inputs that they need specifically. And they'll put them together as a crate, as a bundle, instead of saying, I need the GTK crate, uh, dev crate, and the uh, glib, and heartbuzz, and all these other ones, and saying, okay, well, to install this one, I need these other 300 dev crates. OpenSU says, here's this one bundle, or here's a, you know, a few bundles that will go and actually take care of all of that together. So cargo inputs for us, you know, they kind of work as both their sources. They're supposed to be packages. So our uh, big plan coming up is to go and actually change them from cargo inputs into input inputs, so that way we'll get the actual dependency chain. Uh, right now it's hidden and we can't actually test, you know, testing everything. And we have the infrastructure to go and say, we've changed this input, rebuild everything that depends on it. On a developer machine, it's very hard to do that with, with the cargo inputs right now. And the cyclical dependencies between the actual Rust crates, we have bootstrap packages, we can say, Okay, well, in this case, grab just the source package or build a second one, second version of this package that we'll call it a bootstrap one and actually just take the source and throw it into the output and don't actually do anything and we'll deal with it later. Let's see if I missed anything that didn't actually get copied over. So yeah, so uh, missed the upcoming plan slide. So the upcoming plan was to go and take the cargo inputs and just wholesale, just copy them from cargo inputs into regular inputs. Uh, hopefully that shouldn't create any dependency cycles. Uh, that was really the big one that gets us, that fixes the hidden dependency chain problem. It also goes and helps us test to make sure that we've given the actual 
uh, create inputs that we wanted to have in and make sure that everything is the correct version, we still end up with the same problem of we build the crate and then we build it again for every dependency, but you know, that's a shared library problem and we have to talk upstream with, with Rust more about that. Uh, once everything is moved, or I guess copied from cargo inputs into regular inputs, we can start deleting the actual cargo inputs. The cargo inputs, I don't think I mentioned before, they pull in not only their source, but transitively their cargo inputs and their cargo inputs and their cargo inputs. So you have this large tree of, of source packages that get pulled in the way you would normally have uh, we normally think of a build tree for building, you know, to say I need a top level package, I have series of packages I need to build underneath it. We have the similar thing with the cargo inputs to make that work. So by dropping the cargo inputs from the actual packages and having them just as regular inputs, we can make sure that we're not missing inputs that we're supposed to have. And then the development inputs, was thinking of moving them to native inputs so that one can keep on running tests, but might run into, that's more likely to give us problems with circular dependencies. Right now we're thinking about just leaving them as native inputs in the short term or going and saying, okay, well, here's our 50 or so actual uh, Rust packages. You know, here's our uh, here's Kitty, here's uh, FD, the find replacement, here's rip grep. But for those, of course, run the tests for their direct depend for their direct inputs and maybe a layer before that run the tests. Before that, just wholesale skip the tests. Little unsure about that. Uh, but that's kind of a you know where we are right now with the crates. We have 2,600 crates that really don't have a lot of use for us. And we're really just, you know, we're making it work. Um, you know, they take up a significant, not significant, it's about 10% of the geeks package collection are just rust crates that are there as inputs for other ones. And you know, they're a bit of a source of contention trying to figure out what to do with them because they really don't fit in the classic packaging model of of the compile libraries and use those to link to binaries. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, see if, is there any questions? Hi, this guy is again, I, we don't have, oh, there's a, we don't have a question so far. Unfortunately, so okay. none on Element or on YouTube. Okay. So um, I guess one of the is part of the my plan that I had for today was I was actually going to show uh, one of the packages that I use is uh, Newsboat, and so they a number of years ago started changing some of their internals into Rust packaging. And so that one I've been using as a staging ground uh, of sorts to go and work through some of the uh, pain points with mixing cargo and I think they use uh, CMake, but between using cargo and uh, C packaging to actually link everything together. And the big plan was to go and actually take all of their dependencies for the crates uh, going far enough back that I could do an offline build of Newsboat on my computer using just the crates that were already cached from Geeks. Uh, I guess two things happened. About 100 crates in, I actually haven't finished tracking down, moving all the dependencies back so that they're actually all lined up. And uh, I also got distracted by the RISC-V machine that's humming in the background. Uh, it's, you know, I'm, I'm fighting GCC on that one. And uh, that's been, I guess fun's a bit of an overstatement on that one, but so yeah, so I. There is a question showing up in YouTube. Um, okay. What things would you like to see upstream Rust is resolved as a pinpoints? 
Okay. Um, I think the two, I guess the two things that, well, I'd love shared libraries. Um, I understand Rust isn't going the shared library route, so that's you know, neither here nor there. We can make it work the way we have it. Uh, we don't have issues with static builds. When inputs change, everything gets rebuilt, so we don't have a, really a problem with that. Uh, really, I'd like to be able to reuse build artifacts. Um, I actually tried building one of the Rust packages. I was, uh, one was just temp package one and temp package two. In temp package one, I built it by hand. I copied the build artifacts to temp package two to try to just reuse the build artifacts and everything had to be rebuilt again. And so I guess the number one thing I'd really love would be to go and say, I've already compiled this portion of the code. You know, I'd like to reuse it again over there. So um, since I know Rust has the, you only compile the exact bits that you need, I'm, I think there's something in there where it's actually embedding the path that it's using because it, package one and package two were the same package. They were just in different paths on my computer and that was enough that I had to recompile the entire thing and not just copy from one to the other. So while we're doing all of the building in, uh, in containers, uh, in namespace containers with you know, no network access and you're know, completely isolated, they do have their own separate prefix inside there with the package name and version. And so I've tried just going and collecting the build art, the build, I think artifacts is the wrong word, the build bits from one package and shoehorning it into the next one. And I wasn't able to get that to work. So yes, I guess, you know, main, I guess the pain point really is, you know, like to reuse the, I guess, uh, the, the little compiled bits of the different packages that get compiled from each of the incoming crates. Okay. That's the only question so far. I think I really appreciate your talk. Thank you for that, Ephraim. And um, yeah, uh, thank you again. And have a great rest of the day. I'll hang around and yeah, thanks. <laughs>